I'm Stephen John Drew from the official GunnaGeek.com show, a weekly geek news podcast that is a part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 277 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we discuss how branding your show properly can help grow your audience. Before we get to this week's Better Podcasting download, we'll debut a brand new segment. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, we help out with some Tascam miscast for tech support. Lauren, start the show now. This is Better Podcasting. We are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. Hi, you've reached episode 277 of Better Podcasting. We can't come to the phone right now because SP is off on a rocket. I wish it was off on a rocket. Yeah, Falcon Heavy launched this week. It was supposed to launch a couple weeks ago. It was fun, but you guys don't care about that. You care about hobby podcasting. That's what we're going to talk about, hobby podcast. It's so great to be here in the studio tonight. I'll tell you what, it might not have been possible. Steven knows the backstory of this. My being here tonight is a nothing short of a miracle. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later. But you had fiber installed in your area this week. So let's let that tease lay there over the episode and come back to that a little bit later in the end of the show. Should we do that? That sounds great for me. In the meantime, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Do you want to get right into it? Let's go ahead and talk all about it because we love podcast branding. And most hobby podcasters will say that their brand might refer to their logo. Now, while they're not wrong, it's not exactly the full picture either because podcast branding is so much more than just your podcast square art in Apple Podcasts. No, podcast branding refers to anything that helps come across for a potential listener or viewer to instantly know what it is or who belongs to the thing that they're seeing or hearing. This includes things like elements of podcast logos or podcast cover artwork or typeface and fonts, maybe the color scheme, images that are related to your show that make you instantly recognizable, graphics that you use as part of your show. Like uh, if you've ever checked out the live version of our show or the video version, you know that we have some video graphic layouts for better podcasting. It could even be the way that you message your show to the public. And it's the presence that you create for yourself online. And also your unique voice and tone to your show can also be part of your branding. And we'll come back to all of this in a few minutes. A good podcast brand is perhaps worth more than the show itself because the brand basically becomes a mini movement around the goals of your show. And your audience starts to identify with the brand. Have you ever seen a post in your social media feed that you pretty much can recognize right away who the author is, even without looking at the name? That's because they've established a brand for themselves. Heck, your audience may even get your podcast logo art tattooed on them. Uh Uh-huh. That's actually happened before to shows, hosts, and listeners that both Stephen and I know. It has absolutely happened. But a brand just doesn't happen on its own. A brand can be deliberate and planned, or it can haphazardly happen to you without any real say on your behalf. Odds are, to have a good brand, it takes planning and work. And if you are striving for a better podcast, listening to better podcasting, we hope that you'd be interested in at least exploring a discussion on branding. And then maybe taking some time to start implementing a true brand with what you've learned here. And once your brand is recognized, it means all the more fun for you and your audience can have with your show. Put simply, proper branding of your hobby podcast can help create a strong identity and make it easier for listeners and viewers to identify and connect with your show. And when your audience has a strong identity bound with your show, that community continues to grow as it brings on new members to include all under the brand's wing. 
Now, we mentioned it before, but let's take a second to double down on what a podcast brand actually is. What are we talking about? A podcast brand is not just your show's artwork. And yes, we recognize that many of you only have one piece of artwork with your show, and that's your logo. Many of my shows, that's the only artwork that's with the show, too. I get it. A podcast brand is that thing that becomes recognized and intertwined with your show. Some would even call everything involved an overall strategy to give your show that identity that everything about your show branches out from. The brand includes your ideal audience, your name, your graphics, your voice, and your style. But there is a difference between the, I'm going to do quotey fingers here, brand and the individual brand assets that all contribute to make up your brand. What are those differences, Stephen? Well, first off, your show's logo alone is not your brand. The graphic design around your website is not your brand. Individual items associated with your podcast are not your brand. But these things are all things that help contribute together to make up your brand. So they're not the brand in themselves, but they help. Let's go over some of the assets that do become part of your brand. Of course, we have the logo, the podcast cover art, the typeface and fonts you use, colors, images, graphics, show descriptions, even the picture of SP that you plaster all over the place that says, I, I recommend this podcast. All of these things are part of your brand. Also, your show is a podcast, so you are going to have an audio components to your brand as well. This is important to remember because your podcast is in an audio medium. So you are going to have some things that people hear that make up your brand. This includes things like your unique voice, your tone, your presence, your delivery, even the way that you present your show. Maybe that includes the structure of the show or the way that you go on random tangents about Canadian maple syrup. These things all make up the brand as part of the audio components. Now let's jump into some of the more tangible ideas of a brand, and we'll start with considerations to keep in mind when branding your hobby podcast. The first thing that you want to think about is your audience. Oh, surprise! We're in season three of Better Podcasting, talking all about the audience. Of course, we're going to relate the branding to your audience. The so first thing you need to do is identify your target audience. You need to consider who your target audience is and what they would find appealing. This can help you choose a name, a logo, an overall style that will resonate with your audience. For example, a show that focuses around comic books may want to have a visual appeal that evokes comic book stylings. Or, conversely, a show around home ownership, DIY, or do-it-yourself, may want to have something that creates the feel of building or materials. And you mix up the two, and it may make it hard for somebody to easily get a sense of what the show is. Unless your show is about the TV show Home Improvement with Tim Allen, right, Stephen? Yeah, because I remember Home Improvement had a lot to do with comic books. You're right on that. Well, I mean, it had a comic sort of flavor to it. To say it was sitcom, I, I comic yeah, that type of comic. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Okay. I, I, All right, I, I'll concede. <laughs> Also, uh, when you choose a name, you want to choose a name that is going to be memorable, easy to spell, and relevant to your topic. This all helps contribute to your brand. Avoid using a name that's too generic or similar to other podcasts in your niche. On the flip side, you also don't want to get too long-winded with your name as well, because you really need to think about where your show is going to be listed when you're coming up with your name of your show and how that's going to help with the branding of your show. It might be things like artwork or advertisements or websites, maybe even podcast listing services or just search engine results. Your podcast name is going to be seen across all of these different areas. So let me give you an example. What would happen if you called your podcast Steven Super Terrific Excitable Podcasting About Paint Drying? Well, the odds are that in many places, this name will become unreadable and won't help brand yourself to your audience. This could be that you've got the full name there, but the font is just so small in some of these places that you can't read it. Or it might be in something like a search engine result, just truncated, so it would just say Steven Super Terrific, which, as we all know, those three words never go together. <laughs> 
<laughs> they don't, but they would fit on a podcast logo, which is important, but they have to mean something as well. Which talking about a logo, that's kind of the next step in creating a brand. Once you've identified your audience and you've chosen a name, you need to create a logo. And your logo should be visually appealing and represent your podcast theme or topic. It should also be easily recognizable and scalable so it looks good across all devices. Kind of like what I was saying before about the words looking good on the logo. You, want to, you don't want to put too many words on the logo like Stephen was saying. Stephen's super terrific, excitable podcasting about paint drying is not going to look good on a logo. It just It's not for a lot of reasons, but one of which is it's too long. So it's important to consider that although currently the main podcast resolution is a square format in most podcast discoveries and most podcatchers and most podcast directories, you don't know where in the future you might use your logo and how will it be if it's widescreen eventually. For instance, YouTube podcasting, it's a whole other subject, but usually YouTube is 16 by nine. It's not a square format, just saying. Now, can you expand the logo to extend to that widescreen version or will you have to crop it down? For instance, when I was streaming just to my own account to get a video recording of the Strange New Worlds fan cast that I did uh, just the 10 episodes as a guest producer, I had to, the only artwork I had was the podcast logo. So I had to take that podcast logo and I shoved it into the uh, stream yard and I had to basically crop it up and I had to take the lower half of that logo, which worked okay. It, it looks okay. But at the same time, it wasn't meant for that. It wasn't the true full brand. It was just the lower half of the brand. So that's just an example of does it fit in a different format? And also consider where else are you going to need visual graphics? For example, a website. As we said, a brand is more than just one thing. It's a whole feel, which brings us to developing a consistent style. Yeah, you want to make sure that you are having a consistent style across everything. You want to use consistent colors, fonts, imagery. This needs to be considered across all of your different branding assets. That's things like your website, maybe social media profiles, and also promotional materials. Say, for example, you have yourself a red website, but you have a blue themed logo. How do these th two things correlate together? Probably not very well. So you might want to think about having this same color scheme across both of these different things. Also, when you're thinking about your branding, think about yourself. You want to make sure that you remain authentic in your branding. It really should reflect the tone and personality of you and your podcast. Be true to your brand so that you're not evoking something that you're not. For example, let's say you create yourself a brand that has a super casual feel, but then your actual podcast style is more scripted or professional or highly produced. It's going to create a different image in the mind of the people who are seeing your branding than what you actually are. They might find it a little bit jarring when, you, when they find the misalignment there between the two. And another area that this actually fits into is your podcast intro, if you have one. Podcast intros are a way to sort of brand yourself. It's something people hear when they come into your show and they first discover it, and it needs to put off the feel of the rest of your show. If you have a podcast intro as a brand feel that is very different than what you actually have for a show, it's going to be jarring for listeners. SP and I have both heard this many, many times on many different podcasts where somebody has gone and they've had themselves a super high professional, super produced podcast intro only to then go to the show where it's, say, one microphone in the middle of a table of 20 people talking about random points that you can hardly hear over the random clinking glasses. It's a very misaligned feel between the intro and the actual show. True story. When Stephen and I first asked Lauren, my co-host over on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., who is a professional voice or over artist, to come and do our intro, we kind of felt like 
we didn't deserve it. <laughs> and we had to up our game in order to have the same quality as Lauren brought to the table, being our voice over for the intro. Just say it. It even uh, it applies to us. The next thing that you need to do in your branding quest is to be unique. Your branding should differentiate your podcast from others in your niche. Be unique. Consider what makes your podcast special and how you can highlight that in your branding. A few weeks back, we talked about defining your target audience. How'd you answer that question? What was the avatar for your audience that you were trying to obtain? Now, consider that and then ask yourself, what can you do with your branding to help stand unique and appeal to that specific type of person? As a tip, go ahead and search for similar podcasts and similar names. Do you share common traits with them or their style? And what can you do to differentiate yourself from them? That's how you're going to stand out, even as a hobby podcast. There are hundreds of podcasts, hobby podcasts about comic books or movies or TV shows or tech geeky sort of stuff. How are you going to stand out in front of that? I'll, I'll give you a tip. You know, Stephen and I, we actually don't stand. We sit when we record. So maybe that's how we stand out. We're actually sitting down. That's a <laughs> joke, by the way. <laughs> There's a whole thing about standing up and recording versus sitting down. But Stephen and I choose to sit down. You know, every now and then our listeners need to be reminded that we're dads. And the dad jokes like that, they just play very well into that. I told a dad joke at work this morning. It was, what did Kermit the Frog and Jack the Ripper have in common? And somebody had never heard it that I work with. And they're like, what is it? Well, they both have the same middle name. And he was, ha ha, nice dad joke. I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's what you get, dad jokes. And that's how we're unique. We have dad. No, no, there's lots of other podcasts that do that. But none of them talk about hobby podcasting. So we bring the dad jokes to hobby podcasting. There you go. That's how we're unique. The next thing that you need to do in your branding quest is to consider your platform. Each platform has its own requirements and limitations for branding. For example, your part podcast artwork needs to meet certain specifications for Apple Podcasts. You know, be under 500 kilobytes, be square, 1400 by 1400, or up to 3000 by 3000. Make sure your branding is going to work across all the platforms where your podcast is available, including those tech specifications in each individual directory. I want to give a great example of where some people go wrong with this. And, and it always sucks when you see this as they go in, they create themselves beautiful artwork that has really detailed imagery in it. And someone's put a lot of time into creating it. Sometimes it's some form of photos. Usually it's some form of really high detail. And then it ends up going into somewhere that it's just compressed and it either looks like it's just a lower resolution and it's pixelated or even sometimes the colors get washed out. It always sucks when you see that because you know the original piece was just full of creativity, but it just doesn't come through when the full tech uh, specs are considered. And this was more difficult years ago when graphics programs weren't as available as they are today. Now you have graphics programs like Canva, which literally will give you a podcast logo in terms of the size and the specifications that Apple Podcasts wants. So a lot easier today than it was five, 10 years ago. Now, continuing with considering your platform, although you might be thinking album art with this, which is a valid point, as we just discussed, it goes beyond that. What are the expectations for the technical specifications? What are the norms for the content delivery? Why are you talking about length? You're talking about style. You're talking about tone. And which of these platforms are your priority? And then when you answer all these questions, how does your brand style fit into these things? As an example that we've been using a lot lately, let's take TikTok. TikTok is great for the millennials on down, right? And a lot of people get into them and they have a certain tone and style to them. It's short video content. Same with the Instagrams and same with the YouTube shorts. They all have different tone. Even within those services that I just named, they have different sort of tones. So you have to think, does your podcast and its branding fit within the tone of those three things as you're trying to promote it on social media or just interact with people, interact with your audience, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So you have to keep those in mind. And the last thing that you need to keep in mind, Stephen, you want to make sure that you're updating as required. Your branding might evolve over time as your podcast grows. 
and these changes are going to be needed. Be open to updating your branding to reflect these necessary changes. Now, we'll admit that on our shows, if we just go to the, the go-to thing that people think about, the album artwork, we've reused the album artwork on many of our shows for many years, but it does go beyond just that. For example, with our branding on this show, yes, we've used pretty much the same logo from the beginning, but we have a style for the show that involved playing the bumpers in between the different segments. Well, we've changed those over the years to sort of refresh that. So we still have a branding feel for the show, but we refresh those. We've redone our website to help support our branding. We've even reinforced our brand by continuing what we created originally for the Better Podcasting main show. And when I say we, I mean, there was a, a good friend of SPs who helped create it for us, but we continued that theme across different areas. So it was expanded to shows like Better Podcasting Live Chat or Better Podcasting Chats with SP and other areas as well where we've gone and we've taken that general feel and we've just expanded that into different areas. That includes things like our video overlays where I took that general logo and I changed it into an overlay for the show. And then throughout the years, we've sometimes refreshed and enhanced that branding for the video side of things. So these are all ways that while we have kept the same core logo for our example for better podcasting, we've still been open to refreshing it throughout the years. So we're going to move on and we're going to talk about factors that go into creating your branding. And I want to take a note here and talk about recognizing cost because if you're going into hobby podcasting and you don't have a sense of marketing or branding, there are branding experts out there that you can get help from. Now, the packages for actual branding consultants can range from a few hundred dollars for consulting and brainstorming to well over four digits, talking about a thousand dollars or multiple thousands of dollars, or actually more, depending on what you need for consolidating branding, visual treatments, and hundreds. Uh, to have a branding expert graphics artist on retainer every month. Yeah, this is what bigger shows have to do. They have to pay somebody on retainer and they pay hundreds. You can't, as a hobby podcaster, unless you've won the lottery or you're retired and you're spending your retirement savings on it, you're not going to be able to afford that. But I just wanted to give a sense of how much this actually costs. Doing a branding treatment is in the four digits at least for a graphics artist. And even if it's your friend, kind of want to recognize their time. So keep that all in mind. Now, often the services that I just talked about go well beyond graphics into creating the brand, vision statements and implementation across your entire show's enterprise. Now, if you want to downshift a little bit, only obtaining a graphic artist and their services can also happen. These would be more onesie, twosie sort of graphics and can range in price from what you get on Fiverr which is supposed to be $5, but I think it's more like 20 to $50 now to a hundred, whatever, to hundreds of dollars per creation. And this would be like one logo or one overlay or something like that. Now be careful to either get a full release for the graphics from the artist to use how you want to use, or you might end up, even though you're not paying and getting any money for your show, you might end up paying royalties as agreed upon up, uh, front in your contract with the graphics artist. If the graphic artist is professional, they will give you a contract that either releases you or does not release you. So keep that in mind. Now, moving on for costs, you can also get a coach or a consultant to help you do a brand check with your podcast. I've never had this done, but I have explored having it done. And it's a few hundred dollars to have somebody come in and do a brand check. And of course, you can do all this yourself, which is going to take more time, effort, and you'll have to grow the expertise to actually perform these functions, which honestly, a lot of people don't have. There's some great people out there that can already have this in their back pocket, but that wasn't me and probably not a lot of the other hobby podcasters that I know. So now that we've talked about some of these more tangible items, like the things that are artwork or graphics and those other things that are easy to define, let's talk about some of the other ways that you might want to focus to create the brand for yourself. Well, 
let's go way back to the last couple of episodes. Uh, social media interactions is a great example of this because we talked a few times over the last couple episodes about how you want to ensure that your social media is represented in a way that represents your podcast well. But you should kind of consider how do these interactions impact your brand? Essentially, the way that people are seeing you through that interaction. For example, let's say that we were going to go make a social media post right now about those road announcements that came out a couple weeks ago, you know, like the Roadcaster Duo and all that other stuff. Let's say we were going to go do that on, let's say, Twitter. We could go out there right now and we could put a general question about there, like, what are your thoughts on the Roadcaster Duo? Instead, we might want to ask Better Podcasting, a podcast that focuses for the hobby podcaster, we might instead want to tailor that question to put forward the position of the hobby podcaster. We actually did that, by the way, on our social media. We talked about how in our Discord, a lot of hobby podcasters thought that it was a little bit too high of price for a hobby podcaster. So that's sort of making uh, the, the uh, twist to it that is tailored towards our brand of a podcast dedicated towards the hobby podcaster. You might also consider your interactions and how that's going to align with the general feel that you've established for your show. For example, if you create a very straight laced podcast, it might be out of place for you to have a super cast grams in translation. Stephen told me is super casual Instagram posts, man, you keep up with the kids lingo. That's awesome. We've had a lot of fun with this on Better Podcasting. For example, on the show, we often bust each other's chops, kind of like we've done this show so far. Although maybe that slowed down with our age. Yeah, I'm slowing down. Okay. But we've extended that to places like our Discord server, our social media, etc. It keeps the flavor and familiarity of the show elsewhere. Plus, we just like to bust each other's chops. And to be honest with you, it's a lot of the fun that we have with podcasting is just having fun banting back and forth with each other. I just want to take a moment to say, be cautious. And we talked about this before. Make sure that it is in alignment with how your co-host, if you're doing it with co-hosts, make sure it's in alignment with how they like to be treated and just keep in line, keep the good faith going between you and your co-hosts, if that's what you like to do, because it can be taken the wrong way. We take it perfectly. It, it doesn't matter uh, for us. We know we're just kidding with each other. So just a little PSA. <laughs> the other thing as well is you want to make sure that you consider the consistency across everything that we've talked about today, because you might technically have a website that matches your artwork, and you might have an interaction that matches the tone of your podcast. But do these things all four work together? Because if your interactions and your tone of your podcast are different than the feel of your website and your artwork, then you've got a bit of misalignment between some of them. You also want to ensure that everything that you're having built or the way that you're creating different pieces of your audio, that they all come together and match in some form. Now, they don't have to be all matchy-matchy, but they do need to make sure that it's at least clear that the ships are all steering the same direction. I think you you uh, steer a ship. I don't know. I, I, I'm not nautical. But because hobby podcasters often do have limited financial resources, this can be an area that is difficult. And what I mean by that is, is hobby podcasters a lot of times are either creating things from them for themselves or they are relying on other people to help create things. SP earlier mentioned Fiverr. Fiverr is a place that a lot of people do go to get different artwork done or different voice work done, or maybe even they get their editing services through Fiverr. All of these things contribute to your brand. But let's say somebody went on and they hired one person to do their album art, and then they hired somebody else to do their website. Then they hired a different person to do their voice work. And then they've hired a fourth person to do the editing. All of these people are all creative individuals, and they're all going to have their own creative style. And those creative styles might not match. So you need to make sure that in some way, they will all gel together consistently across the board. And that might mean you need to try to give a little bit more notes of what your personal vision is so that they can kind of, again, steer that ship towards the same direction. They might be 
far apart and taking slightly different routes, but as long as they're headed the right direction, hopefully the, the people who are senior branding will feel that. Again, was the nautical terms right? I don't know, SP. Dude, you live around an ocean. Okay. One thing that I will say before closing up here is if you do want to maintain consistency across your brand and you're thinking about paying somebody, I have a recommendation or two for you. So come hit me up and I'll send you off uh, with a recommendation. Overall, closing up though, branding your hobby podcast can help create a strong and memorable identity for your show by first considering your target audience choosing that name, your logo, developing a consistent style, and being true to your brand. You can create branding that effectively represents your podcast and resonates with your audience. And as a hobby podcaster, this means you get to have more fun. Now we stream the show live to geeks.live when we do record and we do have people watching as we stream live. And one of them today is Damien the DM and earlier while we were talking about the thing that you mentioned that you know it's not all about about artwork he did actually mention that he spent hundreds if not over a thousand on art for his podcast at this point so just gives you an idea it can stack up and he's thanks he thanks for sharing that damien i think it's a good example it is and it has enhanced both his show and the way that they play it's a role-playing game podcast and the way they play the game as well as the fun that they have with it, because they can imagine the characters a little bit more having the proper artwork. So there is a lot of bonuses to what Damien did, but yeah, it did stack up. It is expensive. So we would love to know what has been your experience with branding. If things went well, what went well? If they were a disaster, what was a disaster? And please do talk about those things that we mentioned that aren't the typical things like your artwork. How have you been creating that general brand for your show? Let us know through podcast at betterpodcasting.com. You can tweet us at betterpod. You can find us over on the discord at betterpodcasting.com slash discord, or you can find all of the contact information for us over at betterpodcasting.com slash contact. While you're sending us that information, also, please let us know what you're thinking about next week's topic. What is that? We haven't told you that. I'm telling you right now. It's about cross-posting. That's about getting with your audience on multiple locations and cross-posting the same information, but with a just little different flavor depending where you are. So let us know how you handle that. Shall we get to the debut of our brand new segment, SP? I am. I've been looking forward to this for years. We've made it very clear. We are proud hobby podcasters. That's why we do the show. We love being hobby podcasters and we love helping other hobby podcasters. When we were planning our return into season two, we came up with an idea to help put spotlight on some fellow hobby podcasters. But as we mentioned in the season two finale, some things ended up getting out put on pause. And while we refound our footing, the next thing you knew, the season was over. And without any new segments, uh, we actually mentioned it that uh, we hadn't gotten to it at the time, but that's in the past. And today we are pleased to debut the inaugural version of a new segment you will occasionally hear featured called the Better Podcasting Hobby Podcaster Profile. In this segment, we ask fellow hobby podcasters to answer four key questions. What are those questions? Well, you're going to have to listen to find out. Now, for our debut segment, we have Anthony Sitko from Capes on the Couch podcast, and we want to give Anthony full credit. And, and I have to say, especially me, because, you know, I, I feel guilty about this because I'm going to take a bunch of the, the, the blame for not getting this sooner. Because when we came up with this idea, Anthony was right there ready to support us on this. And, and he, he recorded very quickly for us his hobby podcaster profile. And I've had it for a while. And I'm so excited that we are going to debut it. And you might hear in it that, yes, it was recorded before. You'll hear what I mean. And I want to say thank you, Anthony, because you supported us on this right away. And I really do appreciate that. So with that, let's just get into it and get to the Hobby Podcaster Profile. 
My name is Anthony Sitko. I am the co-host of the Capes on the Couch podcast. Uh, my co-host, Doc Issues, and I have been doing this show since March of 2018. We came up with the name of the show in the car on the way to Pittsburgh, I believe it was. We were going to a Tough Mudder event, and we had decided that we wanted to do a podcast to talk about the various mental health issues of comic book characters. We had bandied about a few names, and Capes on the Couch was the first one that I had come up with that we both kind of liked, but it was also a situation where we said, okay, we both like it, and we'll use it as a placeholder until we think of something better. Well, it's been four and a half years, and we haven't thought of anything better. <laughs> so there it is. It's kind of stuck with us now, and uh, I like it. I'm a big fan of alliteration, so that's one of the reasons why we've stuck with it, and that's what, uh, what I came up with. Biggest podcasting regret, I would say, is probably not having enough time to devote to social media management. I find that the months and the episodes where I'm really heavily focused on the social media is where we get the biggest boost in our downloads versus the time periods where I don't have time to be on Twitter. I'm not doing anything on Instagram. You know, I'm not really being super active on social media in general. Those are the months where I see it's not a massive dip, but there is an impact in the numbers. And the purpose of the show is to destigmatize the discussions around mental health. So our goal, not from an ego standpoint or anything, but just from the purpose of getting the message out there is to get in as many ears as possible. So social media obviously plays a huge role in that. And so if I don't have the time to do it as much as I'd like, or perhaps I should, then that reduces the potential people that we can get our message across to. Conversely, the biggest success that I think we've had is the impact on our listeners and on our fans that we have had. We've had numerous people contact us via message or through social media or email, what have you and explain how much they appreciate the show, how much the show has helped them gain a better understanding of the issues in their own life, get them to take steps towards addressing some of the concerns and problems that they've been having, whether that's through a licensed therapist or life changes, whatever that may be. Just hearing from folks say to us, I heard myself and I saw myself in these characters that you spoke about in your episodes and it has enlightened me to things that I knew that I needed to change. Just knowing that we've had that kind of impact over the past four and a half years really validates for us why we do what we do. And it's one of the reasons why Doc and I will continue to do the show as long as we can, as long as we have the energy and the resources available. And we still have a ton of characters that we haven't discussed and, and interactions with writers and creators and mental health professionals and things of that nature. There's so many new venues we could go with this that we just want to continue to touch people's lives and help them realize that, as we say at the end of every episode, you are not alone and help is out there. So that to us is the biggest success. And that's why I said it ties into the regret, because if I had more time to do that, more time to do the show, then we could add to those successes because that just is the fuel that drives me to do the show in the first place. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of about this podcast and the fantastic support I've received from other shows and other fellow shows on the Gunna Geek Network. Not trying to blow too much smoke, but it is, uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be on the network and to collaborate with some fantastic shows like better podcasting like Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., like play comics and things of that nature. And to just get to play in that sandbox with y'all is a blessing. So this has been really fun and I'm looking forward to hearing what other podcasters say about this and looking forward to hearing other answers to the questions. So thank you, Stephen and SP.
So thank you again, Anthony, for doing that. That is the inaugural hobby podcaster profile here on Better Podcasting. So thank you very much for that. And please do check out the Capes on the Couch podcast. Go check that out. Uh, it's on the Gunna Geek Network. Please go explore the show and let Anthony know what you think about the profile. Again, thank you, Anthony. That profile was amazing. Anthony, thank you very much. And uh, a couple of things that have improved since he recorded that. First of all, he, they are now on their 17th and a half year of podcasting. <laughs> No, not not seriously, just maybe a year <laughs> or so down the road. But that was one. And the other thing is Anthony did start a TikTok account for Capes on the Couch. I don't have TikTok, but I know I've talked to him about it. And he was really focusing a lot of energy there. So I'm curious as to how that energy into his TikTok account has in his experience with that. So Anthony, if you're listening to this, please let me know how that's been going. Also, since he recorded that, he became a dad for the second time. So congratulations, Anthony. You were just a one kid dad when this was recorded. <laughs> You're now a two kid dad. And that is not a joke. That is true. So thank you very much, Anthony. This was awesome. And I really am looking forward to other podcasters wanting to do this segment. And uh, I, I really want to hear more of our listeners and other hobby. Po I don't care if you're a listener or not. I want to hear you, if you're a hobby podcaster, answer those questions. Now, at the moment, full disclosure, our plan is not to do this segment every week. However, we'll, we'll see what happens, how, many, how much response we get. But we would like to hear from you. If you are interested in being a part of this, please email podcast at betterpodcasting.com. If you do have us on socials elsewhere, just go ahead and, and hit us up somewhere and we'll, we'll chat and we might route you over to the email, but wherever you can find us, go ahead and get in touch with us because we do have some questions before we would uh, pass you over the, the questionnaire. So please get in touch with us. And again, this is for hobby podcasters. This is the intention is hobby podcasters. And that is part of the questions that we'll be asking you is all about your hobby endeavors. So please get in touch with us because we look forward to having this more segments of this on future episodes. And if we get enough, maybe we'll have to continue it onto the Better Podcasting live chat. We'll see. Uh, but please email podcast at betterpodcasting.com if you do have interest or like I said, anywhere else that you have us on socials. SP, did I thank Anthony yet? Because I, I really do want to express my appreciation to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think I heard <laughs> that you, you thanked him. Yes, I want to say thank you very much as well, Anthony. And uh, to Doc Issues, Capes on the Couch is a transformative podcast. If uh, you have never listened to it, it is amazing what they do with that show. And yes, it is comics focused, but yes, it is also mental health focused. They've actually helped a lot of people. It's amazing being part of that community. It's amazing having that community being part of Gonna Geek as well. So thank you guys for doing the show. And Anthony, thank you so much for recording that. Now let's go ahead and get into the Better Podcasting Download. This is the Better Podcasting Download. We actually have a triple hit follow-up this week in the download. The first one is Pocket Cast. We talked about their rate increase a couple of weeks ago, and we were confused as to why the rate was increasing and did it apply to current uh, account owners or was it just new? They I'm, have I'm sorry, SP. I, I just checked my pockets and there are no casts in there. I'm not sure what you're talking about. They're empty. Well... I, you got rid of all your Canadian pennies, so there's not <laughs> any pennies in your pockets, that's for sure. There was some confusion about the way they rolled out the new pricing of the Podcast Plus, and they reaffirmed, since we talked about it, the fact that they are moving up for new subscribers beginning April 8th, and this is May now, so this is in the past. It's going to be $3.99 US for monthly subscriptions or $39.99 for yearly subscriptions. However, if you were an active subscriber before that, you will be continuing to renew at the price they set in January 5th, 2023, which was $1.49 for monthly subscriptions and $14.99 for yearly subscriptions. They went on to say, if you've been charged the new amount and you were active, let us know and we will help you with your uh, Google store or, or Apple store of choice. I, I think 
that they, yeah, Google Play and Apple App Store into getting the proper rate. Uh, it's just confusing as all heck, even with the clarification. <laughs> but if you haven't had a subscription to PodcastCast, you will be paying that larger amount, which is about $4 per month or $40 per year U.S. And I, I want to quote this because they go, quote, active subscribers will continue to renew using the price we set on January 5th, 2023, end quote. It doesn't say anything about for all time. It doesn't say that it won't increase in the future. And if I was a betting man, I would bet that at some point that will. And that's just based off of every other service that I've seen grandfathered. Well, most of them eventually do increase the price of it. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. And I, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to confuse myself. Anymore. <laughs> we also had a reply to when we ran the store on story on power press and that they were fixing a vulnerability. I mentioned, and this is on me, I mentioned that the person that left that was one of their main developers and coders was Marco. Marco, if I'm remembering correctly, and please let me know if I'm wrong here, he's the guy behind Overcast. The guy that was at Blueberry was Angelo Mandato. He was the former tech lead at Blueberry. Nobody knows where he is. Well, nobody you know in the public knows where he is. He left Blueberry and he didn't leave a forwarding address, basically. But his name was Angelo Mandato, and he did the tech development behind Raw Voice Blueberry for, well, since its inception, basically. He was kind of a co-founder. So that was another, that was the number two. And uh, Stephen, I apologize for leading you astray, and I apologize to our listeners for leading them astray. You know, just, just know that I will go with whatever you say, SB. I think people can listen back to the episode. You said, Marco, I agreed with you. And uh, next time, just try to extort more out of me. <laughs> noted noted and thank you josh by the way for correcting us we do appreciate that josh liston yeah we do very much josh and the other third hit that i wanted to take in the download today was the hindenburg pro 2 launch when we talked about it it was the day after they were supposed to launch and i didn't check anything i mean i work full time so i came home and i did the podcast and i was like oh yeah it's live absolutely not realizing at their launch event they said we're not live. We have some things that we need to do. So it is not live. And as far as I know, even as we record this on May 3rd, 2023, it is not live yet. They continue to work out some bugs. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with licenses, but it could be some things with the beta that they weren't tracking as well. But it is not live yet. I double checked with a couple of people before I went online here today just to make sure you haven't heard, have you? And no, there hasn't been any improvement. But we also got another tidbit, and we were talking about the video capabilities on Hindenburg. And Stephen, we learned from our astute third co-host, Damien, all about the limitations on the video. Yeah, Damien let me know. He had picked up that I had said I needed to check it out for video, and uh, he had said that it won't work for me because it's single track video. Admittedly, I haven't been following Hindenburg's release that much just because at the moment I've been pretty okay with what I've been using. Plus, I knew people in our Discord would eventually tell me if it was worth checking out and whatnot. So I'll admit my, my focus has been elsewhere, but I, I was excited to find out what the video aspect was. But for me personally, that won't work. Uh, I do like to multi-track video. That's, that's a necessity for my personal use. I know some people do only uh, like uh, single track video editors just because, you know, multi tracks more complex and sometimes it is better for people just to have single and that's fine too. But for me, that's not going to work maybe in the future. But thanks very much, Damien, for letting us know about that. I do actually really look forward to once this launch is out there because I, I believe Damien is one of the ones actually, as well as a couple other people in our discord who have been pretty excited about this. And, and it sounds like it's pretty positive. So I tend to believe the chatter that was maybe about licensing or something like that because I didn't hear a lot of people talking about any showstopper features, shopping features or issues that they ran into. So I suspect it would be something like that. But in any case, uh, I am looking forward to getting all of the information um, when the likes of Damien and others like him, of course, do uh, comment and uh, check it out because there's a lot of people who like Hindenburg and... I look forward to their thoughts on the next iteration of it. 
Yeah, and, and more than Hindenburg, we do have some channels set up in our Discord talking about the more popular uh, editing programs and services like Audacity, Audition, DaVinci, Hindenburg, and Vegas. So if you need help with any of those, or if you have something to contribute, betterpodcasting.com slash Discord, there are channels there specifically set up for that. And on that note, let's go ahead and get to the better pod back. This is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Pod Back. All right, we had a comment actually over in one of the channels. That, this was our miscellaneous Dodd channel. And this comment came from Lane Robinson. Now, we're, I'm going to read this out and going to try to put some pauses in here because I want people to take in what Lane is saying as I go through this because there is some specific thoughts that Lane has here. And he goes, so some background and a general question. I bought a Tascam Mixcast 4 as my first mixer, cheaper than the Rodecaster Pro and very similar specs. The software that came with it was a basic DAW. It's certainly easy, but I haven't used it for long and I'm already kind of annoyed with it. So I'm looking for a recommendation on the replacement. Are there any DAWs that support any form of project template? What I mean is that when I start a new project, I can select a template and it will auto set things such as dropping in a pre recorded intro into an intro track and a pre recorded outro into an outro track and then automatically set which tracks are on and off. And then I want the project directory to be set. The Tascam app always wants to use something under my documents, but I have a different folder for everything related to my podcast. Even when I try to produce and export the final mix, it still goes back to my documents every time. Brackets, so annoying. And obviously, any additional tools for workflow, audio cleanup are appreciated, but those are my current annoyances. Well, that, ta that and Tascam app doesn't do a good job of snapping to things, which makes edits more of a guess, but I assume any real DAW will handle that. Basically, what DAW should I switch to so that I won't be annoyed? Bonus points for cheap or free and not a subscription, but money isn't the highest decision factor. So before we get into the thick of this, I want to say uh, I've tried this Tascam app because uh, some of you know, I was experimenting with the Tascam Mixcast 4. I actually plan to kind of go back to that and give that a second crack here pretty soon. And you kind of got to use this editing software to export the poly wave files. So uh, anyways, I've used it. 100% agree with you. I think there's some shortcomings on it. I've tried it. I didn't give it a full try, but it's it looks very basic. It looks like it's got a long way to go. So I, I know where you're coming from on this. Um, for the project files, a quick thing that I'm just going to throw out there is that I, I think SP and I operate very similarly where we kind of keep like a, a, a saved blank folder that we can go and we can retrieve every time. So what I mean by that is like in DaVinci Resolve, I would have a, a file that's just called template that has all my latest settings on it that I know that I'll want to use. I open that up and I save that as say Better Podcasting episode 277 and I save it as, I don't repl uh, re uh, replace it. So. I think SP does a similar thing where he has a project file. And so then if changes ever need to be made, you go back to that project file and make changes on that. It's I know that that's technically a little different than template. And this is one of the questions I'd like to dive into more. Is there a reason that that you use the word template? Because some people in other software do use templates where when they update that template, it updates existing projects that use the template. And so if that's the desire where let's say uh, you want to be able to update a template and I'll use my example here where we're recording episode 277 of Better Podcasting. If I updated the template, it would, if I went now open episode 276, all of those changes would be impacted. Um, I don't know if that's a, a request. Personally, I, I wouldn't want to work that way just because I'd like to keep everything as it was at the time. But it's, it's a question and some people operate differently. And so that's the follow-up question that I'll be asking about this. 
Man, I didn't think about that in terms of the template, but I would think that you might have problems with plugins over time too. And that was the other thing that I wanted to talk about, bonus points for cheap free and not a subscription. The actual DAW itself might be cheap or free, but odds are you're going to eventually want some VSTs or some plugins to go in there, which will be added effects to every single track. And you might have to add them per track or per project. It depends on the DAW itself. That can get pricey. You can work off of free ones, but eventually you'll see the benefits of investing a little bit into paid plugins and and they can get expensive. So I understand all that. I operated for years trying not to put money into VSTs and eventually I just gave up and was like, oh, it sounds so much better. It's so much, the projects are so much easier to do that. For cheap and free, there is audacity. It is better than it used to be. There are some concerns about privacy still to this day. I know they kind of debunked it at the time, but I still wonder what's going on there. Uh, Reaper is also not technically free, although they can use it as a trial for a month. And it's still, I think, $60 for it. And it is both a video and an audio editor. I have yet to use it. I need to get into it, but I know a lot of people get into it. And Stephen, before I go on with probably something you're familiar with, there is one that I am not familiar with that you've been using lately. Yeah, and DaVinci Resolve is one of them, and it it works well. But at the moment, my experience, if you're looking just for audio, I can't say for sure that it's not a setting, but I would, if if you're looking just audio, I might look a little bit elsewhere because there is a little bit of stutter when I go to playback and, and sort of, it's not super smooth as far as, as playback goes when, you, as soon as I hit play, there's a bit of a weird lag almost. Now, um, I personally think that if you're looking for a video and audio editor, I think, you know, you got to weigh the pros and cons and you're kind of mixing two things right there. And and for me, I'm really happy I've switched over to it compared to what I think you're about to talk about, just because the overall saving experience and stuff is less bug fill from what I've seen. But if you're looking just an audio editor at the moment, based on my experience, I, I might pause and look at something else. Maybe something like Reaper. Yeah. Uh, the one that we are both experienced in using, Stephen has transitioned out of it to use the DaVinci, is Vegas Pro. I'm using Vegas Pro 19. I think they have Vegas Pro 20 out now. I have not updated to that, although I should look into that. I haven't heard that there's any effects in there that I would really definitely want to use. I have, over the years, gotten more and more into the capabilities of Vegas, really learning that, and I still have a lot to learn. It is expensive, very expensive. It's very capable, but very expensive. And uh, it has a history of crashing. Uh, I have, both Steven and I have high-end gaming computers, but if you take a look at the components, it's all the same thing as a gaming computer. And it still crashes from time to time. There's still little things about it. Like I have to make sure I actually close the program and open it back up in order to render and have all the effects render after I've been editing for a while. So there are some drawbacks to it, but I've enjoyed it a lot. And like I said, I need to explore some other things. There's another one that actually we mentioned earlier that I feel obligated to talk about, and that is Audition. And while I have not used Audition in the past, it is a very capable audio editor. However, if you're talking about cheap or free, it's not exactly either cheap or free, even with the subscription model. And Stephen, you have some experience with Audition. Yeah, um, I I like it. I think it's good. Um, I definitely actually kind of started there. But it is a, a subscription. And if it's the only thing you're getting, I find it hard to justify over some of the other things that are out there. Like, I've experimented a little bit with Reaper, and it's a very capable program. and. There are some musicians that actually really prefer Reaper over Audition. So it's it's very capable. And if you're not already getting Creative Cloud, Adobe Creative Cloud, I, I struggle to see people it, it fitting in for people 
if you're a hobby podcaster. Now, if you're making money, that's a whole other thing. There's You're going to have um, ongoing expenses. There's a lot of benefit to using something that is kind of what's the industry norm is the Adobe suite of products. So there is some benefit to that for sure. There are some really decent built-in things as well. And Adobe does keep experimenting with some of these like AI type tools and whatnot. And I think that's only going to help your endeavors. I know when you look at things like Photoshop for the photo side of things, there's a few tools in there that they just edged out the competition a little bit with some of the smart analysis for removing things. Um, I know in the video side of things, they've got some tools in there to help break up things automatically and, and whatnot. So you know, you do get that benefit when you go with Adobe. But again, it is subscription. And also, by the way, if you want to check out Better Podcasting episode 271, I believe it was, uh, we talked about a bunch of the editing choices that were available. You go to betterpodcasting.com slash 271. I will say that confidently now that I've verified it. Uh, go to betterpodcasting.com slash 271. And we did talk about some of the editing choices there. And just real quick to throw some names out there on the Mac side of the house, there is Pro Tools. There's also GarageBand, which is basically free. And there are other things out there as well. Like if you want to edit by word, there's the script out there. I could get into it, but there are options out there. If you have options for Lane, please come to our Discord server at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord and give your recommendations to Lane because we're just two guys with a limited amount of experience. Granted, we've been doing it for a while and have probably more experience than somebody that just has entered into podcasting, but we are looking for your experience and what you would tell Lane. So come on into the Discord server and, and help Lane out. Which, by the way, if you do come to the Discord server, it is officially the Gunna Geek Discord server, but you'll see a variety of various podcast channels, including the Better, po Better Podcasting channel. But we have things like the Tech and Gear channel where you can talk about all sorts of latest techie and gear things. So first, come to the Better Podcasting slash Gonna Geek Discord, which has the best geek community around. And while you are there, you should go to that tech channel and ask SP all about his fiber that he now has. And we're not talking about the stuff that's in his bowl of cereal every morning. <laughs> Yeah, in the past week, I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to be able to upgrade from broadband cable to fiber. There were some issues with it. We could talk about it later, but it is working pretty good now. We'll have a better report in a couple of weeks as Steven gets to play with how much data he's able to pull from me. <laughs> and that means the strength of the signal. I do have a 4K camera, so we'll see if we can get something more. 4k ish in the final product from me. I know I've been looking washed out. I've been looking pixelated. That is because of the miserable upload that I was getting out of broadband cable. And now I have symmetrical one gig. So we're, we're going to play around with it. We're going to see how it, it works. And yes, it didn't go completely smooth. There were some issues. I was talking with Steven the whole time because he was, he was like, do you have it? Do you have it? Do you have it? Because he wanted to play with it on I his did. end tonight. <laughs> yeah. So we, we will uh, go and uh, experiment and we'll talk more about it later. But if you want to ask me about everything involved from going from broadband cable to fiber, come to the Discord server. I will gladly answer any of your questions. And I want to actually twist this back to talking about podcasters because we've talked recently about how video has become a thing in podcasting. Whether or not you want to put your old man heels down and say, it's not a podcast. Well, too bad. People are calling it that. And in my experience where I live, because I do have fiber as well, and there's really two main options that I have where I am. And one of them is a, a cable broadband provider. And the other spent a ridiculous amount of money over the last 10 years adding that fiber infrastructure. Well, the cable provider really can't at this moment give the same amount of upload speeds. And for those of you who aren't sure what that is, it basically means information that's coming from your house going out to the internet. And they, so, so the provider around me, they like to really advertise that they can match 
the same type of speeds as the fiber provider. But the reality is that they're able to offer gigabit or even higher download speeds, but not that much upload speeds. And for an average person that's just, you know, watching Netflix or doing whatever, not so much a big deal. But if you are a podcaster that's doing things like video streaming or regularly uploading large files, not having a big upload can slow you down. And it can slow you down with sitting there waiting for the file if you're doing a big video upload to YouTube to be done. Or it can slow you down in the sense that it can make it so that you can't put out as clear of a picture or you're subject to more interference with that outgoing stream. Audio is not a huge deal because most audio feeds going out are a huge amount of uh, bandwidth. But if you've got video in there and all of a sudden something else starts going out and you have a small amount of upload speed, that can impact it. And I'll give you an example of this. SP, I think you had 25 megabits per second upload before, right? I was paying for 15. I got about 22. Okay, so you got 22. And after the show, SP very religiously uploads his file to, to where I can now download his audio file, that his audio track he gets on his end. And he does this while we're on the phone or on the video call after just chatting a little bit. And every time he does it, I can tell when he's, he was doing it because all of a sudden his video quality went, went down. Now, obviously, SP pays attention to this. He makes sure nothing's going on while he's recording. but Let's say that, that you were in a house where you have a big family or you have a family that you can't control that while you're recording. And all of a sudden, you've got a kid that now starts a big video call or starts uploading a video to Google Drive or something while you're recording. That might impact what you're sending out if you're using a remote service and that can have an impact. So by having a larger upload speed like SP has now and and... I have uh, didn't want to make it about myself, SP. Uh, but like we both have, you're not subject to this interference as much anymore, unless all of a sudden there is a really big anomaly. So it does matter, especially if you're doing things like video. So I wanted to sort of twist it around and say, yes, you have a thousand megabit per second upload now, and that does seem like a lot, but it's not necessarily excessive either. Yeah, as I said. I'm going to test some things out. Steven's been having this capability for a while and we'll just see how it goes. There is the possibility for me to go to two gig at some point in time. It is a little bit more money. I don't know if it's going to be worth it. There's a lot of infrastructure in a, in a bigger house with the Wi-Fi and with routers and with backhaul. And I don't want to get too technical here, but most houses, I would say, are not really equipped to do anything more than a gigabit. And matter of fact, a lot of houses aren't even equipped to do a gigabit because of the infrastructure they have to deal with. Uh, so I am fortunate enough to be able, at least to this computer, get gig symmetrical, which means with the podcasting, we're able to do a little bit more. I might be able to, I've been taunting this for years and years and saying, oh, I can't do it because I've broadband <laughs> cable and my upload is so bad. I might actually now be forced to <laughs> do Video Ninja with OBS or with XSplit on another show that I do, like Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. or something like that. So I'm going to do some experimentation over the next few months if I have time and uh, try, try my hand at that. I mean, I'm using StreamYard right now, which I'm happy with, but there are other capabilities out there that I can take advantage of the new uh, streaming. Also, it, it really depends on your co-hosts because I know my co-hosts mm -hmm. don't have all gigabyte stuff. So I, I don't want to put them behind like I have been for this show. I don't want to put them at a peril basically because they're uploading 4K video to me and like their spouse is trying to play a video game. Hey, what's going on? I'm stuttering here. I don't know. What's going on. So yeah, I get it. So it, it's not <laughs> just the person that you're connecting with. It is the whole household that you have to take into consideration. So if you are somebody who likes to talk about these sort of things, again, come to our Discord server at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord and say congrats to SP. Uh, SP, I'll say it to you right now on the show. Congrats on your fiber. I know that sometimes you're not regular with the old broadband. Yeah. Well, it, it was a sad day last night uh, when I got it working and uh, I put the toggle 
uh, right underneath the monitor here, I, I shut it off and it has not been on <laughs> oh. yet. And it, from the modem, I shut down the modem for the final. T- I, 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 I said, it poured a little out and <laughs> I, uh, shut it off and uh, it has been off. It is still active. I still have it active in a couple of days. We're going to go to the cable store and bring all the cable stuff in. And I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to get YouTube TV and it's going to save me about hundred dollars a month. So oh, wow. not only is it faster and arguably I get better capabilities across the board, but it is cheaper. And it's like, I don't know how the cable companies are going to stay in business with areas that do have fiber. And eventually, like 6G or 7G or whatever is going to have that capability. So even fiber companies are going to find it difficult to compete, not to mention Starlink. So lots of things going on right now. So for episode number 277 of Better Podcasting, I'm Steven saying SP has lost one excuse for not using Video Ninja. Please tell him another. And I'm SP saying it is fun talking about hobby podcasting every week and i can't wait for next week see you guys then bye bye thanks for checking out another episode of better podcasting you can find the full back catalog of better podcasting at betterpodcasting.com if you're into geeky podcasts please check out the other podcasts on the gunna geek network at gunnageeknetwork.com this show was produced and edited by steven john drew Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching, and we hope to see you again next week.